Coming up, the Saturday surprise. FAA agrees to allow the closure of Santa Monica Airport. What's it mean? Exclusive interviews with FAA Administrator Michael Huerta and AOPA President Mark Baker. Bringing a B-29 back to life, we get an inside look at the restoration of Doc and honoring African-American aviators, past and present. AOPA Live this week begins in just a moment. There are many important things to consider before purchasing an aircraft. Let the experts at Aerospace Reports help guide you through the process. We combine expert knowledge with our long-standing commitment to personalized customer service to perfect your transaction. Learn more at aerospacereports.com. This morning, the Santa Monica City Council reached a historic agreement with the federal government to close Santa Monica Airport forever on December 31st, 2028. The Saturday morning surprise. The FAA agrees to let Santa Monica close its airport. The shock was felt around the aviation world, but the airport isn't dead yet. So we're not done yet? Nope, not done yet. In fact, Mark Baker says this agreement provides certainty that the airport will live for at least 12 more years. Now what I believe in is we actually have the opportunity to keep this airport alive. And we've taken the uncertainty away, which has been, you know, laying over our head in the tenants for years. That, frankly, the airport could have disappeared in any given day, any given month, with the, uh, a judge somewhere that didn't fully understand and have the opportunity to shut the thing down. So I'm actually pleased that we have removed the uncertainty. And it was the fact that a judge at any moment could have closed the airport that moved the FAA to agreement. We felt that there was litigation risk, as did the city. And one of the things that we were concerned about given the court calendar and how the court calendar was creeping up on us, that there was a very real possibility that the city could prevail and we would be forced with a situation and the industry would be confronted with a situation where the city could close the airport immediately. But now the airport stays open for 12 years and the city is obligated to be serious about running it as an airport. The courts have accepted the agreement and uh, you know the, co the courts want to ensure that it is going to be abided by. And so our team in Southern California, our airports office, our inspectors, you know, certainly understand what this agreement is about and we're going to be quite vigilant in ensuring that uh, the terms of the agreement are adhered to. As part of the agreement, the city will be allowed to shorten the runway to 3,500 feet the city thinks they can do that within months, but... As part of the process of shortening the runway, the city has to come to us with a specific proposal. They have to ensure that there are runway safety areas on both ends of the runway. And then that begins um, a process where we're, we're evaluating it both under the airport layout process and doing an airspace evaluation of how would we have to redesign procedures for that to, uh, you know, to accommodate a different length of the runway. Uh, as they will also have an obligation uh, to go through a California environmental process that we are not party to. And then all of that needs to be completed uh, before we can certify the new airport layout plan, the new procedures, um, ensure that the nav aids are in place and uh, go forward. And in the extended time that the airport will remain open, there is a chance to change minds. There's nothing in the agreement that says the airport must close. Well, it means to me, Tom, that you know, there's a chance over the next 10 or 12 years we can work with the citizens, the tenants, the city council to improve the relationships and hopefully grow the relationships so that they understand the vital importance of that airport. So we're not done yet. 12 years is a long time. Yes, it is. And now there's a lot more to this issue and more nuances than we have time to cover on this short report. I invite you to watch my full interviews with AOPA President Mark Baker and FAA Administrator Michael Huerta on AOPAlive.org. And you can read more about this historic time on our website as well. Meanwhile, Administrator Huerta now has a new boss. The Senate confirmed Elaine Chow as Secretary of Transportation Tuesday. The A's are 93, the nays are six. One senator responded present and the nomination is confirmed. Vice President Pence swore her in later the same day. Chow had served as Deputy Secretary of Transportation in the George H.W. Bush administration. Ever feel you've been charged too much for ramp fees or gas at some airports? Or yet you don't know what the fees are? Well, you're not alone. It's happened to me, it's happened to AOPA President Mark Baker, and it's happened to a lot of you. In January, we ask you to report your experience any occasion where you felt the fees and prices were unreasonable. And survey says? 
The vast majority of FBOs across the country are doing a fantastic job serving their customers and their communities. Now, we've been listening to complaints from our members, and based on what they're telling us, it looks like their problems centered at about 20 locations around the U.S. If members anywhere feel that they've experienced unfair pricing, we want them to reach out to us and let us know. We're concerned any time a member feels that they're having a problem. So that's why they can give us a call if they're comfortable doing that, or they can go online and give us the feedback that way. AOPA is working with the FAA about price concerns. Federal law says that airports receiving federal funds must provide services at fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory prices. You can continue to report your experiences via the AOPA website. The FAA's annual general aviation survey for 2016 is starting soon. The survey is an essential source of information on the GA fleet, the number of hours flown, and the ways GA aircraft are used. The results help determine infrastructure funding, safety statistics, and other important information. If you get a postcard asking you to complete the survey, please fill it out, even if you didn't fly in 2016. Of course, you check the NOTAMs before you fly, right? Let me say that again. Check the NOTAMs before you fly. Super Bowl 51 is this Sunday, and if you're flying near Houston, checking the NOTAMs would be a game-winning idea. NORAD will have fighters on patrol to intercept any errant aircraft. This is video of their jets doing a refueling exercise during a media flight this week. The TFR during the game is 30 nautical miles and from the surface to 17,999 feet, folks. There are other TFRs around the event as well. Plus, President Trump will also be in South Florida over the weekend. There is a TFR in place for that as well. Once again, did I say this before? Check the NOTAMs before you fly. Aviation would not be where it is today without the contributions made by African American aviators. In honor of Black History Month, we are taking a look at some of the icons of the past and how they paved the way for the current generation. AOPA Live's Paul Harrop has the story. It is impossible to put black history into just one month. Imagine trying to put it into 140 characters. How would you tell the story of Emery Malik in a tweet? He's the first black man to have a pilot's license, earning his FAI ticket in 1912. He went on to design and build a glider. He would fly to work across the Susquehanna River in Pennsylvania. It would take volumes to tell his tale, but one woman hopes to fill your social feed one story at a time. But A.J. Wilson is the aviation queen. She's a respected aviation journalist and blogger, and her Twitter feed is populated this month with black aviation history. So I tweet under Av Queen Benet, and for the past four years for Black History Month, every day I do a tweet about a black who has made a contribution in aviation. There are so many important people who have contributed to the art and science of flight, but you don't have to work hard to find out Benet's favorite. Bessie Coleman in the 1920s decided that she wanted to learn how to fly, but no one in the United States would train her. And her quote was, I refuse to take no for an answer. So Bessie learned French and went to France and studied under World War I pilots. She became the first African-American woman to earn her pilot's license. And what people don't know about Bessie Coleman is she also studied aircraft engineering with Anthony Fokker. I think that's a name that um, a lot of aviation people recognize. And there are many others. Alfred Chief Anderson. Um, Chief Anderson is known as the father of black aviation. Chief Anderson founded the Tuskegee Airmen. Captain David Harris. He became the first African-American pilot hired by a major airline. He was hired by American Airlines in 1964. But the way for that was paved by um, Captain Marlon Green, who sued Continental and it went all the way to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court ruled in his favor. Saiza Mizamela is making recent waves. She was the CEO of South African Airways, and she, a few years ago, she started her own hair airline called Fly Blue Crane, making her the first black woman to start an airline. All of these historic figures paved the way for the next generation of pilots of color. Anthony Oshinuga is an air show and air race pilot. He's a first generation African American. His parents immigrated from Nigeria, and he grew up poor. A lot of the things that I've gotten um, to, the, to date was just me busting my butt, just you know, in the trenches, just sweating tears, getting, getting these accolades or these accomplishments done. 
He says the financial barrier to entry was the toughest thing to overcome and that lack of means may be a big factor in keeping young black people away from aviation. He works to show kids from impoverished areas that with hard work, they too can fly. Because when I go talk to these kids, you know, I'll come down the runway, I'm going down 180 miles per hour, land, jump out of, out of the cockpit with the microphone and start talking to the kids. And the kids are like, whoa, I can't do that. I'm like, yes, you can. Yes, you can. Don't say you cannot do that. You can do this. You just need the right mentorship. You just need the right people around you, the right support system to get to get through, to break through that the situation that you're in right now. It's paying forward the inspiration that he draws from pilots like the Tuskegee Airmen and Bessie Coleman. It tells you that through all the adversity that was going on back then, she did it. She did it. There's no reason why we can't do it right now. Paul Harrop, AOPA Live. Thanks, Paul. Good stories. AOPA is working to lower the costs for flying for a lot of people to get started. Our Flying Clubs initiative is part of the You Can Fly program. Flying Clubs are one way to ease the financial burden of learning to fly. Coming up after the break, some cool new airplanes out of the Sebring Sport Aviation Expo. We go behind the scenes to hear the stories of the hardworking volunteers who brought B-29 Doc back to life. Meet the pilots who fly with AOPA Insurance. They love flying and saving money, just like you. At AOPA Insurance, we understand how you fly and provide the coverage you need to keep on flying. Call for a free quote and see which AOPA Insurance plan is right for you. The U.S. Sport Aviation Expo had a solid finish last week. After years of weather setbacks, Sebring held on to the Florida sunshine all four days, boosting attendance. The drone races continued to draw a lot of traffic throughout the week and more than 700 students came to the show to hear from famous aviators. Meanwhile, Swift Fuels had a major presence at the show. They sold unleaded 94 octane aviation fuel. The fuel is different from the drop-in 100 unleaded replacement that is undergoing FAA testing. The company makes one of the two fuels being tested for that program. But meanwhile, Swift sees UL94 as a way to introduce the market to the benefits of unleaded fuel. Swift recognizing we had capability in town on the unleaded fuel business and a lot of people clamoring wanting to have unleaded fuel, we started marketing on UL94 fuel, which is a lower octane fuel, but nevertheless it meets the needs of about 65 percent of the U.S. fleet. That's over 100,000 airplanes can fly the fuel. Many airplanes will need an STC from Swift to fly with the fuel. UR94 is available at dozens of airports around the country. You can visit the Swift website to see where you can get it. B-Light Aircraft announced a new two-place experimental design at Sebring. B-Light is known for manufacturing aircraft instruments and single-seat ultralights. The new airplane, called the Pipper, has a classic design and side-by-side -side seating. The airframe will be made out of lightweight aluminum honeycomb. So forecasting one of the lightest weights in two-seat experimental designs. This allows you to use smaller engines and have equivalent to performances to heavier, higher operating uh, higher operating cost aircraft that are larger. The airframe kit is expected to cost around $9,000 and will have its first flight in the next couple of months. This is the first year an unusual special light sport aircraft made its debut at Sebring, the Skyrunner. The Skyrunner is an ATV powered parachute combo. It is a off-road aircraft, what we like to call it. Uh, you have two separate engines. Uh, you have a Polaris Pro Star 1089 horsepower for the ground portion of the aircraft. And you have a Rotax 914 uh, UL 115 horsepower turbo engine for the aircraft portion. Off road tires, Fox suspension. It is one of the most amazing off road uh, vehicles out there to date. The Skyrunner is targeting high end users who want to be able to fly anywhere. The military is also said to be interested. The Skyrunner is in full production and costs $139,000. And moving on to a much bigger and older airplane, B-29 Super Fortress Doc has now flown several times. It took a dedicated team of volunteers to get to that point. AOPA pilot senior editor Al Marsh goes behind the scenes to show what it took to get Doc flying after so many years. Seventy years ago, a B-29 loaded with bombs was a slow climber. Today, a B-29 that will never again carry bombs climbs for the first time in decades. 
volunteers in Wichita have rebuilt Doc. And this is their story. Well, it, it, it was a little heavy on the, on the controls, but uh, uh, it's a good flying aircraft. And uh, uh, of course, they didn't expect you to be doing any acrobatics in it, you know. It was quite an aircraft first day. And actually, it was the biggest gamble that the War Department made. It cost $3 billion, that program. And uh, the Manhattan Project cost $2 billion. In 1956, all of the airplanes became property of the Navy again, and they shipped all the remaining airplanes out to China Lake to be used as ballistic targets. And so they, uh, they ran bombing missions and, and destroyed most of the airplanes, but they never did hit the airplane. So we're, uh, if they had, we wouldn't be here today. And now 15 years and about almost 300,000 volunteer hours later, you, uh, you get the airplane over here. And it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a special project. A lot of the volunteers were Boeing mod mechanics. They were the best at what they did. Over the years, yeah, we've had hundreds of people. Uh, some of them, folks have just lost interest. A lot of folks have passed away, gone on to different jobs elsewhere. We've still had this core team that about any more than 30 to 50 people that just is in love with this airplane. My husband thought it was a good idea. It gave us something to do because we were both retired. My passion for my husband is what keeps me coming in. Is It's his dream, so I've made it mine also. Said to myself, this is a dream that he was hoping for. Of course, he didn't live long enough, but it's okay. He's seeing it. <laughs> Three eyes and four ears. <laughs> in over 15 years, we've become a pretty good family. We have a good time. We're just kind of a family of bums building airplanes. <laughs> The person to be honored the most is Tony Mazzolini, because, you know, Tony's basically the savior of the airplane. <laughs> we were trying to figure out what to put on his business card. <laughs> we didn't think savior was maybe <laughs> the right thing to put on there, but, you know, without Tony, there'd be no dog. My dream was to recover it, uh, restore it, and uh, fly it. And I wanted to have this as a flying museum. Those people that were on the home front that helped build these airplanes, the people that went into military service, those who had served, flown, built, and ultimately made their, their sacrifice in this aircraft, I wanted to honor them. Our younger generations, our current generations, and future generations do not know this history. And this is a way of bringing it to them. Doc's first mission was just to fly. Its second mission is to find funding for a permanent home in Wichita and teach history to the nation. Al Marsh, AOPA Live. What an amazing story of an incredible airplane, really beautifully done. You can read more about Doc in the February issue of AOPA Pilot Magazine. That's it for this week. Join us again next Thursday for another edition of AOPA Live This Week.